What's one thing that fairy tales drive into our heads from the second we can read? That stepmothers are evil. In the real world, most people whose parents aren't together want them to find somebody. After all, parents are still humans. Why shouldn't they have companionship? When kids are involved, things get more complicated. You know what they say, you're not just marrying the person, you're marrying their family too. For one single father, he thought he'd met the love of his life online, but the woman he moved to the other side of the world to be with turned out to be nothing like the person he married, and his daughter would suffer the consequences. Zahara Claire Baker was born in Wagga Wagga, Australia on November 16, 1999. Her parents, Adam Baker and Emily Dietrich, were a young couple engaged to be married. However, after she was born, 19-year-old Emily developed severe postnatal depression. The relationship broke down and Emily gave full custody to Adam, who moved himself and his daughter to Queensland with his parents. They settled in Giru and Adam took a job at a sugar mill. For the first few years of her life, Zahara was a totally normal kid. Then suddenly in 2005, every parent's worst nightmare came true when Zahara was diagnosed with bone and lung cancer nobody saw it coming. She was a funny, smiley, energetic kid, and within a few weeks, all that had changed. In order to save her, doctors had to amputate part of Zahara's leg, which meant she would have to use a prosthetic for the rest of her life. Her illness also cost her her hearing, and she was made to wear a hearing aid. But amazingly, after 18 months of treatment, the cancer went into remission, and the Baker family could finally look forward to seeing Zahara grow up, if only they knew what was to come. As his daughter was fighting for her life, Adam had taken to spending his nights on the computer, talking to people through an online chat game called IMVU. There he met a woman whose screen name was Gothic Fairy and lived on the other side of the world in North Carolina. The real identity of Gothic Fairy was actually Elisa Fairchild. At 40 years old, Elisa had been married six times and had three children of her own. To her IRL friends and MySpace page, she declared that she'd fallen in love with a younger man all the way in Australia. Before long, Elisa traveled out to Queensland and met Adam in person for the first time. In 2008, the couple were married and abruptly moved back to the States, taking Zahara with them. Elisa didn't make a positive first impression with Adam's family and friends, to say the least. His mom, Karen, was totally heartbroken when Adam took her granddaughter, who was just getting back to full health, to a completely different country. Kim Wright, a friend of the family, thought Elisa was strange and told a lot of far-fetched stories. These included a story that she used to be a police officer before she was injured on duty and had once been a bounty hunter. The family relocated to Hickory, North Carolina, and it didn't take long for their newly built life to start falling apart. For the first six months, they lived with Elisa's dad until he kicked them out due to Elisa's ongoing issues with sobriety. They then moved into an apartment complex owned by their landlady, Shirley Mims, who lived next door to them and saw for herself how dysfunctional the family was. Shirley was actually surprised to learn that Zahara was their daughter. She saw the little girl so rarely that when she did, she assumed she was a visiting granddaughter. However, after a few months in that apartment, they were once again asked to leave by Shirley because their behavior started to disrupt the other residents. Next, they moved into a trailer park where Elisa got a bad reputation among other parents. On more than one occasion, their neighbor Tanya Heffner saw Elisa treat Zahara super badly, hitting her and teasing her about her prosthetic leg. Tanya contacted the police and told them her concerns for Zahara's safety, as well as her school, who had worries of their own. Zahara was eventually taken out of public public school after a concerned teacher gave Zahara her personal cell phone number, so she had someone to contact if she ever felt she was in danger. After she started being homeschooled, teachers would still visit the house occasionally and once reported seeing Zahara with a black eye. But the authorities did nothing to help Zahara, who was totally alone in an unfamiliar country, living with one parent who hated her and one that never stuck up for her, according to witness testimonies. Of course, Elisa tells a very different version of events. In an interview with Liz Hayes, Elisa said she never did anything to hurt Sahara and that the two were super close. We hit it off right from the bat. She had a spunk about her. She never gave up, always had a smile on her face. She called me mom and I treated her like she was my own child. She got no different treatment than my other kids did. Actually, my other kids got jealous of her. They said I treated her better. This is obviously a pretty big difference to what was being reported by family and neighbors. You can make your own call on who's telling the truth based on what happened next. On October 9, 2010, Hickory Emergency Services received a call from Elisa at 5.30 a.m. She reported a small fire at the back of their house. On arrival,
arrival, the fire department discovered Adam's truck had been set ablaze, and there was a thick smell of gasoline in the air. After extinguishing the flames, they discovered what looked to be a ransom note. The note was addressed to Adam's boss and landlord, Mark Coffey, and claimed to have snatched Mark's daughter during the night. They demanded a million dollars in exchange for her safe return, or his son would be next. The police carried out a wellness check on the Coffey family and found that they were all safe and sound. They thought the incident was more likely some sick prank intended for Mark, but the assailant had mistaken Adam's house for his. That would just be the start of a crazy roller coaster this family was about to take the police on. Later that day, Adam called the police again with a startling piece of information. Someone had been taken, his daughter, Sahara. The theory was that the fire that morning was meant to distract police, as well as Elisa and Adam, while Zahara was taken from the house, mistaking her for Mark Coffrey's daughter. Zahara's disappearance was front page news the next day, and police worked tirelessly to find her, along with the FBI. But before long, the case started to unravel. On the same day Zahara was announced as missing, Elisa was arrested. A lot of people took this as the news that she was involved in her stepdaughter's disappearance, but the police made it very clear these were on unrest related charges. It was later revealed that her arrest was due to writing bad checks and for failing to return loaned property. Next, Adam stunned the police by telling him that he hadn't actually seen his daughter since October 6th, three days before she was reported missing. This looked bad for Elisa too, who told the police she'd checked on Zahara around 2.30 a.m. on October 9th and saw her asleep in her bed. After a cadaver dog, a trained dog to detect the scent of human remains, indicated that a body had been in the house as well as in one one of their vehicles, an Amber Alert was sent out. Although officers believed at that point that Zahara was probably no longer alive, they still went from door to door in the neighborhood showing her photo to residents in case they'd seen her. But things didn't get any clearer. The public was shocked when a few days later, one of the investigators appeared on live television and stated they had no idea how long Zahara had been missing for, but the time frame could be as long as a month. In a later interview, Adam would reveal in the five months leading up to her disappearance, he'd barely spent any time with his daughter because he was struggling with sobriety. The last time he remembered seeing Zahara was two weeks before the day she was thought to have vanished. Naturally, suspicions turned on Elisa and Adam. A stepmom with a history of cruelty and a checked out dad? It was just a matter of time before something happened to Zahara. A few weeks later, the Amber Alert was canceled and Elisa was taken into custody. She'd admitted to writing the ransom note and some of Zahara's remains were found in a wooded area. Elisa led the police to the location and her cell phone records confirmed she was in the area around the time Zahara disappeared. Elisa claims the whole thing is a big misunderstanding. She went out one day to get some cash, and when she came home, she saw Zahara lying unresponsive on her bed. Instead of calling an ambulance, she tried to perform CPR in Zahara for an hour before accepting that she'd passed away. That's kind of believable, right? I thought so too. Instead of calling emergency services and saying, hey, my stepdaughter with cancer just passed away. Can I get some help over here? What Elisa did was unthinkable. I won't go into detail, but I'll just say that when they found Zahara's remains, they weren't all together. They found her prosthetic leg first, which identified her, and then found her limbs separated from her torso. Her skull was found a short distance away. Because of the state of her remains, it was impossible to determine how she died. However, with all the lies from Elisa and Adam, police felt confident that she hadn't died of a natural cause. Elisa was charged with causing Zahara's death unintentionally and obstruction of justice for writing the ransom note. She pled guilty to avoid a charge of first-degree homicide and was sentenced to 18 years in prison. However, she earned an additional 10 years a year later due to being found guilty of charges related to narcotics. Although Elisa insists that Adam was involved in disposing of Zahara's remains, no evidence could tie him to the case, and he was never charged with any crimes relating to it. He was later deported back to Australia after it was discovered his marriage to Elisa was void due to the fact that she never legally divorced her sixth husband. As far as Adam's involvement goes, Sahara's biological mom describes it best. There's a big difference between not being guilty and being innocent, and I don't think he's innocent of what happened. To this day, Elisa maintains her innocence, as does Adam, who returned to Australia not long after the trial was concluded. He took Sahara's ashes with him, and together with his family, they buried her in the family plot. That brings us to the end of today's video. What did you guys think of this case? Do you think there's any truth to Elisa's version of events? As always, I can't wait to see what you think down in the comment section below.